Welcome back, theatre fans, to a very special Theatre Thoughts podcast. On today's podcast, we have the absolute honour of sitting down with Leanne Cope, who is currently in rehearsals for the Australian premiere of An American in Paris. Leanne Cope is a British Tony and Grammy-nominated dancer and actor and originated the role of Lise Dessan in the Broadway and West End productions of An American in Paris. We sat down with Leanne to discuss her career, her past involvement in the show itself, as well as what theatre fans should be expecting from this new national tour, which starts in Brisbane in January. So sit back, relax, switch on those thoughts, and please enjoy this very special Theatre Thoughts podcast. time Tony Award winning Broadway musical An American in Paris, based on the classic movie with music and lyrics by George and Ira Gershwin, features an outstanding Australian cast and ensemble drawn from the worlds of musical theatre and ballet. Broadway and West End leads Robert Fairchild and Leanne Cope will reprise their show-stopping turns as the American GI Jerry Mulligan and the young Parisian dancer Lise Dessan. Audiences in Brisbane, Adelaide, Perth, Melbourne and Sydney will have a once in a lifetime opportunity to experience the extraordinary talents of Robert Fairchild, Leanne Cope, Cameron Holmes and Dimity Zuri as they take to the stage in this buoyant, beautiful and breathtaking production from January 2022. Leanne Cope, welcome to the Theatre Thoughts podcast. We are more than excited to have you on the podcast today. Oh, thank you so much. (laughs) You're in Melbourne rehearsing for An American in Paris. Yeah, we do Brisbane, Adelaide, Perth, back to Melbourne, then Sydney. We finish in Sydney. Lovely. They get the lucky ones first up in Brisbane. (laughs) I, I guess for our listeners, if you could just introduce yourself first for those who aren't familiar with you and your work, just kind of give them a bit of scope about you as a performer. Okay. Um, um, so I'm Leanne Cope and I'm British, as you might be able to hear. <laughs> um, I actually started my performing career as a ballet dancer with the Royal Ballet. I went through the whole kind of training, so through the Royal Ballet School, and then I joined the company when I was 18. And then about 12 years into my time in the company, I'm going to give away how old I am now. Um, <laughs> uh, Christopher Wilden was um, in London creating his ballet, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, which I think is a very popular ballet here, actually. I know Oz Ballet do it a lot. And he um, messaged me at the time asking, um, uh, I heard you used to sing in the choir at school. Would you like to sing for me? And I thought that's a bit of a strange request. <laughs> Not knowing, he didn't say what it was about at all. And it end up being my kind of audition for an American in Paris so I left the ballet company well I didn't leave I took a sabbatical they were really actually wonderful and said I could come back and just take this time away um so I took some time off to go and create the role we did a workshop and we opened in Paris first then we went to Broadway then we came to the West End and now I'm here (laughs) excellent (laughs) obviously everything that's happened in between we all know what's happened in between let's not mention that (laughs) yes there's kind of moving on from that it's the behind us now (laughs) (laughs) yeah so it was really just by chance it was the real fresh uh you were discovered as the you know the term is yeah I guess so it's it's strange because I was thinking about it theatre musical theatre has always been kind of my first love um I love ballet don't get me wrong um but musical theatre was my introduction to theatre I went to see Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat with Jason Donovan oh wow (laughs) I remember a a trip up to London with my mum and dad and my brother and my godparents that was my first experience of a musical and apparently I was absolutely gripped I was literally on the edge of my seat whereas my brother was asleep under the chair yeah (laughs) Um, yeah musical theatre probably is my my first love I remember when when I lived in the UK Joseph Joseph is a very different musical I think over there it's uh it, it seems to be that it's one of the most popular musicals I think and anyone who does musical theatre has some sort of connection to Joseph in <laughs> some form Absolutely. and 
I find that fascinating, personally. So you're bringing An American in Paris to Australia. You originated the role of Lise Dessan on Broadway and then took it to the West End and now you're originating Lise here again. Uh-huh. Could you just kind of give us a bit of an idea on who Lise is in, in the kind of aspect and context of the show itself? Well, I guess she's she's kind of the leading lady. And um, what I love about Lise is um, you kind of start the show as a, a kind of young woman who's she's Jewish. The show is set at the liberation of Paris. So we all know how the Jewish people were treated during the Second World War. And she's been in hiding for the whole of the war. Um, and she kind of emerges from, I was going to say lockdown then, but it gets it kind <laughs> of it's this young woman. I mean, she started the war probably a, a kind of teenager and now she's suddenly this young woman out into the world and she she's a young ballerina and has this passion to dance and also has a really high sense of duty to not only her parents, who unfortunately we don't know where they are. We can all imagine what's happened to Lisa's parents being Jewish, but um, a sense of duty to her parents to live a very full life because they didn't get to, and a duty to the Burrell family because they looked after her during the war and they risked their life and their safety to hide her. So um, this very big sense of duty and that having to do everything on behalf of other people, but in the end, she makes a decision to do something for herself, which yeah. is to end up with the man that she truly loves. So I think that's a really wonderful journey for her throughout the show. And all the characters go on this fantastic journey throughout the show, discovering new things about themselves. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's got a lot of hidden depths, this show. And every time I get to do it again and I rediscover in rehearsals, I find more and more each time. It must be just like an exploration of the character. I was watching a, a YouTube video on you talking about the character on Broadway. Uh -huh. And your discussion about like the background of, of Lise was, was fascinating to see how much you can actually go into um, a character just kind of beyond, um, I guess, the surface level of who they are. And, and, and American Paris has been transferred from film now to stage, written by George and Ira Gershwin. And it's this beautiful amalgamation of classical jazz, symphonic jazz, but with Broadway sort of styles to it. So how does it kind of translate how do you believe the context of the film translates from film to stage? Do you think it kind of changes and adapts in any way that makes you appreciate it more? I think the, the fact that the show is set, like I said before, at the liberation of Paris, whereas the film, the movie is set kind of the beginning of the 50s. So Paris is a very different place then. So the film is very much MGM, Technicolor, isn't mm -hmm. everything wonderful? Wasn't it a wonderful war? It's, the war's not even really mentioned, apart from the fact that Jerry is a GI that stayed on the GI Bill to stay in Paris to learn his um, craft of being an artist. Other than that, the war is not mentioned. Whereas because we've taken it right to that point of liberation, the stakes are so much higher for everyone. So it's a, it essentially is the same as the, as the movie, as in the characters, but the stakes are just a lot higher for each of them and what they've been through and what they're bringing to the table when they all meet. It is kind of amalgamation of these characters at this moment in time and their journeys to get to getting over what has just happened to them. Yeah, so it would be, I guess it's quite, it's the surrounding of the, like the show is quite heavy subject matter, but the musical stylings and the current choreography is so gorgeous with the ballet like I was watching clips from the show and I, I watched the uh, recording that you did for the uh, the show must go on recording mm -hmm. and I was I was honestly I was mesmerized like yeah. I'm not I'm not a massive like ballet person I've always wanted to go to like a full-on ballet show and I think this show is a perfect middle ground to meet for people who love the ballet for people who love musical theater and it kind of meets right in the middle would you yeah. kind of agree with that? Absolutely. I remember when we were first um, doing a lot of press for the show and they said to myself and Robbie, don't mention ballet because they were so scared that people would be scared <laughs> of right, it. Right, okay. Not come to the show. So, but then when people came to watch and they actually realised this kind of, the joy of it and this kind of, it's the 11 o'clock number, you know, it's the big, big number. And it is, you know, it is impressive and it is emotional. And I think people are like, oh, okay, 
ballet's not as unreachable as I, untouchable as I thought it was. And then maybe they'll go buy a ticket for the ballet. And I think it works vice versa. People who only ever go and watch ballet are suddenly like, oh, okay, Robbie Fairchild, principal from the New York City Ballet, let's go and see a musical. And it's gonna be exactly the same here. You know, we're doing this um, in conjunction with the Australian Ballet. Mm. So um, we have Dimity and Cameron from the Australian Ballet, both principal dancers, and that kind of transference between the two worlds um, is it, just really, really exciting. So as a, a trained ballet dancer coming into a musical theatre context, what sort of training and rituals do you sort of bring into before you start a show? Like, is there anything that you particularly do each time? Yeah, it's I will always do my ballet warm up. So ballet, generally before a show, it will just be a, a bar, maybe a little bit of Pilates. You just need to get your body warm. Um, but then I've had to learn how to get myself ready vocally because that was just never something I would have done when I got ready for a ballet. So my warm up is now twice as long as it used to be because I have to do <laughs> vocal warm ups too. And to just kind of get yourself in that headspace of being Lee's. I mean, generally, as soon as I put her with that wig on and the costume, I just kind of transform into her. Yeah, the warm ups a lot more. A ballet warm ups very physical, but obviously, and the vocal warm up, but the kind of the more mental and emotional warm up that you have to do for for a show, for a musical, is is very very different than what I would have done for a ballet. And I guess unless you're playing Juliet or mm. something with which is a very dramatic role, but um, yeah, it's it is quite different. But ballet class, ballet bar, always. Without a doubt. <laughs> and and how many? I'm 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 gonna embarrass myself here. I don't actually know the names of the shoes. Uh, but um, okay. the point how shoes, point shoes? Point shoes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the only <laughs> <laughs> the only term I know is on point because uh, it was like the only thing that my um, movement teacher used to say in in university was make make sure your toes are on point. I was like. Got you. Um, <laughs> uh, but how many pairs of shoes would you go through a regular sort of week in a show? So you do roughly like seven shows in a week, or like yeah. a good week, I suppose. I'm quite light on my shoes. I've changed to my, I actually wear an Australian brand of shoes. Oh, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Just plug it in there. Yeah, chuck it in. <laughs> um, they're fantastic because they've last, they last me a lot longer than the other shoes that I used to wear, which I'm not going to mention because I don't, they're still wonderful shoes, but I don't yeah. want to. You know, diss them. Um, <laughs> but some ballerinas will go through literally a pair of show. Wow. It's a lot of sewing because you have to sew all the ribbons on, the elastics and everything. But um, I probably go through maybe two or three pairs a week. Okay. Yeah, right. where some dancers may do like seven. Right. Like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It's, it's a lot of it's a lot of effort to be on your toes for that long. Yeah. So it must like it obviously takes down the shoes. Yeah. I mean, they're holding your whole body weight. And mm. once you start sweating, because they're made mainly out of kind of um, canvas glue, basically. Oh, right. And Fascinating. They're made of wood. They're definitely not made of wood. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I, that would just be a different level if so they were. Once, once you start sweating, that glue and that canvas kind of starts to disintegrate. Bit, they get too mushy. And then you can get injured if they're too soft. So that's why you go through so many pairs. Oh, okay. I love I love learning all new parts of theatre. So that's like really fascinating to me. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess let, let's get back to the Australian production and your <laughs> castmates. Now, obviously, I'm not going to ask you to compare castmates from Broadway to the West End and so on. But what? Uh, how has it been getting to know the the new Australian cast? So you start rehearsals Monday. You know, so this really got to know people yet that much. I haven't seen them in rehearsal because I'm literally just popping in doing class and leaving um, and letting them get get on with it a bit so um I the moment I'm at the point where I'm just trying to learn everyone's names yeah. <laughs> and, um, and learning their actual names not their characters names yeah. uh, but everyone's been so so friendly um yeah it's it's been lovely to meet everyone finally because they've been going now this is their third week of rehearsal right so they're well into it they're uh, yeah they're really into it so Robbie and I only start on Monday so we kind of only have 10 days before we head off to Brisbane because they're kind of think oh they know what they're doing they've done this before and I'm like ah, it was a while ago <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah so they've been rehearsing for two weeks already okay um and they, apparently they did a run of act one on like after the end of the first week which is insane if anyone who has seen this show will know it's not just that it's not a scene change as in blackout fly something in lights up the dances the scenery moves the scenery dances for those who aren't familiar with Gershwin's work 
what would you kind of say to them to kind of wrap their heads around what they're coming to hear and see? Yeah, so the Gershwins are quite remarkable, really. Ira wrote most of the lyrics and George did the, um, composed the music. So um, not only are George and Ira famous for writing, you know, your songbook of I've Got Rhythm, it's wonderful, but George famously has written, well, Porgy and Bess, which, you know, is an incredible opera, but George also lived in Paris for a while and wrote an American in Paris, the ballet at the end of this um, of the show. He famously wrote that in Paris and was inspired by the city itself and how it, it came to life. And you can actually hear, there's a moment there's like taxi horns and apparently he picked up this taxi horn in a, um, like a flea market type thing in Paris. And he had that in the original score and this taxi horn apparently still exists within the, in the Gershwin family. Oh, right. um, and it, in a similar way that um, George Gershwin wrote Rhapsody in Blue as a kind of dedication to New York. Okay. And American in Paris is a dedication to Paris. You're getting a bit of everything really. There's something for everyone in there. Beautiful. I think that's probably what makes this, well, a smash here or what made it a smash here on, on Broadway in the West I think it works from, like it would work really well as just a, a kind of concert piece really Mm. because it's there is so much music and even there's a moment in act two where um there's oh now I'm gonna forget the song but a very famous (laughs) Gershwin song but it's not being sung it's just being used as background music right oh okay you know they they had when um Christopher Wilden got the rights to make this show the Gershwins allowed him to use anything he wanted wow apparently uncalled like unheard of Okay. Um, said, right, you can have anything you want. So they literally just picked bits here and here. I'm like, oh, we can just literally have eight bars of this or 12 bars of this. And they kind of put it together. It's it's fascinating, actually. They've done an incredible job. And because the, the Gershwin estate is, there's the Ira estate and there's the George estate and they don't uh, always okay. eye to eye. But on this project, they did. And they were like, you can have it all. You can have what you want. And I think that's what makes it so special musically. Wow. Okay. What, what do you say is next for you? So you've got... American in Paris here, coming, doing the tour in Australia. And then, then what? What would your dream role be next? Where would you want to go? Um, oh, it's so difficult, isn't it? Because uh, there's so many wonderful shows out there. I would love to kind of put a pair of tap shoes on. <laughs> I love <laughs> tap. Uh, anytime in a musical where a tap yeah. number comes in, I'm sold. I'm I mean, like I'm not a tap dancer by any means, but... I love the kind of thrill of learning a new skill. Mm. Um, as you can tell, like having not spoken or sang on stage, like, yeah, sure, I'll go to a Broadway show. Um, I would love to uh, um, do something with tap or um, I, what I think I suit is these old school musicals. So something like Singing in the Rain would be an absolute dream. Yeah. But um, yeah, who knows? Uh, but there's so much going on there. There's so much new, new things happening. Yeah. Like with after COVID and everything, everything it's if you look back in history and it's the same with this you know with an American Paris after the war there's such an amazing kind of influx of art that Mm. happens because everyone's been so suppressed for such a long time that suddenly all this creativity happens. And I have a feeling that that's what's going to happen now. I, I totally and agree. Everyone's been so suppressed for such a long time. And yeah, okay, people have been created, creative on Zoom, online, Instagram, whatever. But to then be allowed to suddenly all be together and be creative together again, I think there's going to be a huge, huge amount of creativity going on. And I think theatre is going to be absolutely booming in this time next year. Thank you so much for coming on Um, I'm so excited for you and I'm so excited to see it actually myself and just experience something entirely new Uh, will you be coming to see it Sydney Sydney. I'll be in Sydney okay well we'll be well into it by then so the show will be slick (laughs) exactly (laughs) (laughs) tickets for an American in Paris are now on sale via americaninparis.com.au the musical will tour Brisbane QPAC's Lyric Theatre from the 8th to the 30th of January, Adelaide, Her Majesty's Theatre from the 5th to the 19th of February, Perth, Crown Theatre from the 25th of February to the 12th of March, Melbourne, Arts Centre Melbourne State Theatre from the 18th of March to the 24th of April, and Sydney Theatre Royal from 29th of April 2022.
Well, that's all the time we have left here on the Theatre Thoughts podcast. Don't forget to follow us on our socials at Theatre Thoughts Oz. That's Theatre Thoughts AUS. And be sure to leave us a rating or a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, stay safe, keep those thoughts rolling, and we'll see you next time here on the Theatre Thoughts podcast. Podcast.